Today's reading comes from Matthew, chapter 6, starting at verse 19. Treasures in Heaven Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness! No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading comes from the extended passage in Matthew's Gospel known to us as the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to the people that are gathered around him, telling them about the kingdom of heaven. And then, as a consequence of that, speaking about how they should live their lives in response to it. Our selected passage begins with a contrast between earthly and heavenly treasures. As Jesus talks about them, he makes it abundantly clear that there is a difference between the two. He tells us to spend our time and energy in storing up heavenly treasures as opposed to earthly ones. The reason for this teaching becomes clear when we consider how easily earthly treasures can be taken away or destroyed. In contrast, Jesus tells us heavenly treasures are lasting. We can see this demonstrated in our own lives. Where do we find ourselves if the treasures that we have spent lots of time and energy acquiring or building up are suddenly removed from us in some way? For example, how have we and others felt during this time of lockdown where many of the things that we have acquired or prepared have not been able to be used or enjoyed? Jesus also makes the point that the drive that we show, that we possess, for acquiring, storing or building up treasures illustrates what we consider to be important in life. And one of the consequences of this is that those things that we continually focus on can become our idols and then begin to draw us away from God. 
There then follows a short section on the eye, which appears at first glance to be unrelated to the preceding three verses, but in actual fact relates directly to the question of what we consider to be important. This is because Jesus is speaking about the eye effectively being a window on the true self of an individual. Just as the tongue can indicate our true self, as James talks about in his letter, as it can show our heart, so our eye can do the same. What our eye, our focus is on, indicates what is important to us in our life. Jesus then moves on to tell us that no one can serve two masters. Instead, we are called to have but one master, God himself. And yet, how often are we foolish and think that we can prove him wrong? How often do we act in ways that demonstrate we strive to try and manage balancing two masters? What level of hubris do we show in acting like this? For the reality is that we know only too well the truth of what Jesus says. We know that we cannot balance two or more masters. We know that to try to do so only leads to failure and distress. We know, we understand deep down that we should follow, we should serve one master alone. The question we are left with is, who or what will that master be? Will we seek to follow Jesus or will we give our lives over to the pleasures and treasures of life? One of the great idols of modern living is materialism. It has been said by some that he who dies with the most toys wins. But the reality is that this is far from being a godly way of life. Materialism has a hold on people precisely because it appears to provide for their needs. More specifically, it appears to provide for such needs as security, as personal wealth, as power, as independence and as pleasure. But let me try to illustrate how this is not actually the case. Let's look at each of these things in turn. Firstly, security. This is only a fantasy. We think that we provide ourselves with security by acquiring things. We think that we have protected ourselves against all circumstances and possible events. But this is only a false belief, because it can all be snatched away so easily and cruelly. How many people have found this to be true in the last few months? How many people have discovered that the security that they thought was there has suddenly disappeared because of the ex extraordinary situation and circumstance that we have all found ourselves in? Each and every one of us has had our lives disrupted. No one has avoided the effects that COVID-19 has brought into our world and our lives. All of us are wondering quite what the future will bring and exactly what will be left remaining of what we used to call normality once lockdown finally comes to an end. And yet, even with all of this background, despite everything that is happening in our lives and in the world around us, we can still find security. It may not be found in the places that many people sought to look for it, but it is still available. For true security only comes through knowing one's future. And while in some regards this probably sounds like a foolish thing to say, because no one can know their future, and yet all people know what comes at the end of life. We as Christians, though, we do know something about the future. We know that there will be a time that Jesus has promised will come and when all things will be made new. And it is that that gives us hope and it is this that gives us security as well. The second fallacy is personal worth. Many people try to increase their own personal worth. They try to make themselves to be something, to be seen as something, to be upheld as someone. People are fickle. Such worth, when built on shallow foundations, can change in an instant. Just take a look at the tabloid press for examples of such things. We all want other people to view us well. We all want to be seen in a good light. It is, after all, only natural. But at the end of the day, it is also somewhat superficial. What is actually important, what matters is how we are viewed in God's eyes. Then there's power. 
And whatever power we might aspire to, or indeed even achieve here on earth, is in the end only false power. It can only come about because God allows it, and it fades away in the light of his power and authority. Then there's independence. And we all have a, a tendency to seek after independence. And of course, in some respects, it is healthy. For example, in our development as we grow up, as we become adults, that independence that we seek is important. But there is a worse type of seeking after independence. It is when we seek independence from God. When we seek this, there are always problems. The end result is always sin. And the story of Adam and Eve, whether you take it as literal or not, the story of Adam and Eve illustrates our failings and demonstrates the repercussions that occur when we seek such independence. And then there's pleasure. All too often people seek after pleasure. And there are many and various ways that people do this. But the problem is that whatever it is that we seek is often temporary. It is transient. It soon passes by. And then we concern ourselves looking for the next fix. We need to realise that true pleasure, true joy comes through relationship with God. And when we build our other relationships on him as well. In such things, in such ways, building on the foundation that is God, can we find true pleasure? Can we find true answers to everything? As we progress through our passage, Jesus moves on to one of the most challenging parts of the whole Sermon on the Mount, a part that many people find difficult to hear. For he tells us that we should not worry about things. Now, following on from those things that materialism fools us into believing, we also discover that worry is one of the byproducts of materialism. Indeed, materialism often leads to worry and questions like, how can I retain this lifestyle? How can I get the latest thing? Or how can I clear my debts? These questions can consume us. We can spend all our time chasing that which ultimately has no value or worth. Jesus tells us to refuse this way of life and to stop worrying about how life will pan out. Instead, he says, we are to trust in God. And the verses that follow this statement expand upon the theme. Jesus begins to open up the question of worry by looking at the example of birds and of food. Birds do not worry, they simply live their lives. Then Jesus asks, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? What a great question this is. What good does it do us to worry? And yet we all do it at some point. Having looked at the example of the birds, Jesus provides another illustration. This time it is that of flowers and clothing. The flowers do nothing, they just are Yet look at their beauty, he says. They are cared for and provided for. Thus it follows that God will also provide for us. And Jesus tells us that we should not worry because we are supposed to understand God's care and trust in him. To worry, he says, is to be like those who do not believe. Instead, we should seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This statement directs us to look at what our priorities should be. Not earthly things, but God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And when God's kingdom becomes our priority, then we find that all these things will be added unto you. In doing things God's way, we find ourselves blessed. In seeking his kingdom, we find blessing greater than we presumed or imagined. And because the message is so important, Jesus reiterates the direction not to worry. And again, he draws attention to the matter of where our priorities lie. If we align ourselves with God by seeking his kingdom, then there is no need for us to worry. This does not mean that nothing bad will ever happen to us. That is not how things work, and it is not how God works. But the reason that we should not worry is because God is with us at all times. So when things go wrong in our lives, as they are bound to do, 
we can rely on God to be there for us and strengthen and support us through the challenges that we face. Thus, we should live each day as it comes. Each day is a gift and should be treasured as such and not wasted in worrying unnecessarily about the future. And yet, worry is a problem for us. Worry is something that is all too easy to slip into. And it is all too easy for someone like me to preach that we shouldn't worry. Because preaching can sometimes be based outside of the real lives that people live. But that shouldn't be the case. Preaching should speak to each and all of our lives. So yes, worry is a problem for many of us. How many of us worry about what might or might not happen? We find ourselves saying things like, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know how I'll cope if X or Y happens. But of course, the thing is, we generally do cope when X, Y or even Z does happen. How many of us do manage to cope when something does happen? And more to the point, how much easier was it facing whatever the event or happening was through worrying? The American minister and author Max Lucado says this. He says, meet today's problems with today's strength. Don't start tackling tomorrow's problems until tomorrow. You do not have tomorrow's strength yet. You simply have enough for today. Just hear that again. Meet today's problems with today's strength. Don't start tackling tomorrow's problems until tomorrow. You do not have tomorrow's strength yet. You simply have enough for today. This is something we should grasp. God provides for us day by day. He is sovereign and he is God. We should place our trust in him and not worry about what might happen. For for all we know, it might not happen. And if it does, he will be there for us. So what more do we need? Amen.